Is the Essex boy's killer still at large? An ex-detective claims police ignored a shooter clue link in the infamous shotgun murders of Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe in 1995. The last man called by one of three gangsters murdered in the 1995 Essex boys killings was never questioned by police. It has emerged. Retired detective David McKelvey says the suspected villain was linked to a man who has previously been named as the shooter but was never charged. Instead, Jack Wombs and Michael Steele were jailed for life after being convicted of blasting the drug dealers with a shotgun in their Range Rover 26 years ago. But Mr McKelvey and his team of highly experienced former murder detectives now claim to have found evidence supporting the account of an East End crook who told police he was the getaway driver for the real killer. Mr McKelvey, who runs private investigation firm TMI, said, quote, We have done a thorough and detailed investigation which has led us to believe there may have been a miscarriage of justice. Compelling new evidence throws the case into doubt and we are appealing for witnesses to come forward. The bodies of Pat Tate, 36, Tony Tucker, 38, and Craig Rolfe, 26, were found on a remote snow-covered farm track in Rettendon, Essex, on December 7, 1995. According to the prosecution, they were shot dead the night before, between 6.48 and 6.59pm. The final call, made from Tate's mobile, apart from one to a girlfriend, was at 18.26 and lasted 17 seconds. It was never disclosed at the trial. Mr McKelvey said the vital witness, Tate Rang, is repeatedly named in the police murder file as a person of interest. Days after the murders, an action was raised to interview him, but when his solicitor said he was refusing to talk, officers gave up. The papers reveal. Mr McKelvey said, quote, How can you not talk to him? He was the last person to speak to Pat Tate on the phone before he was executed, around half an hour before it. We have requested a meeting with the Chief Constable of Essex on six occasions to ask him about our findings without success. As a result, we will be asking these questions in public. Mr McKelvey believes the evidence supports the account of East End criminal Billy Jasper, who gave Essex police a detailed account of how he was the getaway driver for a named assassin. Detectives made no inquiries into his story, file show. Mr McKelvey says he has seen intelligence which links the alleged shooter named by Jasper with the man called by Tate before he was shot. He said, quote, What we have established is the 1826 call was made to an individual who was connected to that man through an armed robbery in 1989. This was known to Essex police in 1995 and 1996, but they never formally interviewed these people about the murders. The convictions of Wombs, now 58, and Steele, 76, rested on the testimony of convicted fraudster Darren Nichols. Mr McKelvey, who arrested Nichols in connection with drug smuggling in 1996, had believed the pair were guilty. He plans to present his findings to the Criminal Cases Review Commission and Essex Police. An Essex Police spokesman said, quote, There was an exhaustive investigation, and the evidence has been examined by the Criminal Cases Review Commission and the Court of Appeal. This case is under review of the CCRC, and it would be inappropriate to comment further. The youngest of the three, cocaine addict and gopher Craig Rolfe, 26, was found slumped behind the wheel. He was suspected of murdering a rival drug dealer by giving him a lethal injection just days earlier. Behind Rolfe in the Range Rover was the body of 18 stone Pat Tate, who was the gang's enforcer and had a long history of violence. The night before his death, the 36-year-old steroid abuser attacked a restaurant manager, slamming his head into a glass plate counter following a row over pizza toppings. He simply wanted cheese, you can't. Tate, who had been released from prison a few weeks before, was an associate of M25 road rage killer Kenneth Noy, who he had met in jail. The leader of the group, Tony Tucker, 38, was a doorman who controlled the drugs trade in a number of Essex nightclubs. Pat Tate met Mick Steele, a known drug importer, and Jack Wombs, a car mechanic and insurance fraudster, while in prison. The prisoners, who were all from Suffolk and Essex, kept in touch after their release. Tate, a bodybuilder, went on to become an enforcer for Tony Tucker, who was involved in the drugs trade in Essex nightclubs during the explosion of the rave scene in the late 80s. 
Informant Darren Nichols claims Steele and Wombs had become angry because an earlier narcotics deal had gone wrong. He said this was their motive for luring their victims to the country lane on the pretext of discussing a cocaine shipment. Wombs, who was cleared for release from prison earlier this year, applied in 2019 to the Criminal Cases Review Commission to have his conviction overturned and the case is still being considered. His application is thought to include details of a Scotland Yard bugging operation that recorded a gangster offering to take out the dealers who supplied Leah Betts three weeks before they were murdered. Tucker, Tate and Rolfe controlled a supply of ecstasy in the Basildon Club where the tablet was bought. Details of the bugging operation appear in the 2002 Scotland Yard draft intelligence report called Operation Tiberius, which claimed gangsters had infiltrated the Met at will. The Mirror revealed in 2017 details of the gangster's proposition to a retired detective then suspected of corruption. An extract in the report states, On the 16th of November 1995, ex-officer met with criminal associate who offered the hand of friendship by offering to take out the supplier of the drugs to Leah Betts, who died of an overdose. The Tiberius report also names Jasper and says he was shot in a non-fatal attack, though it does not say when. Billy Jasper was arrested for armed robbery a month after the murders on January the 15th, 1996. He claimed another criminal, Jesse Gale, who later died in a car crash, gave him £5,000 to drive an accomplice known as Mr D to and from Rettenden, Essex. He says Mr D was going to do a cocaine deal with the three men. Jasper testified at the Old Bailey murder trial that he had agreed to the plan and later spotted Mr D's 9mm Browning pistol and sawn off shotgun when he drove him to the murder scene at Workhouse Lane. But Jasper did not fit with Essex Police's theories. The Essex Police log noted January the 18th 1996 that the account did not fit with the current intelligence, direction and evidence already available. Four months later, Darren Nichols told police he was the real getaway driver. But David McKelvey said it was a blinkered investigation. Darren Nichols made his confession after police stopped him in a car that had cannabis worth £10,000 in the boot. Such was the significance of his testimony that while summing up at the Old Bailey trial, Mr Justice Hidden told the jury, quote, I hardly need to stress the importance of Nichols' evidence. So much hinges on what he said. At the time, neither judge nor jury knew that Nichols had agreed to a commercial arrangement, with a writer to publish Blogs 19, a book about the killings which made Nichols several thousand pounds. He remains in hiding after being given a new identity. Okay, so the real point of interest in this article is this telephone call, the 17 second phone call at 6.26pm. Now clearly the phone schedules that we have, that we've looked over over the last two years, are not complete. It would appear that reading this article that even the defence didn't know about this 17 second phone call. There appears to be this phone call here, 17 seconds in duration at 6.26, to an unknown person made by Pat Tate. Now what is interesting to me personally about this 17 second phone call is how it can relate to the phone call from Sarah Saunders. Now we know, according to her police statement, that during the phone call between her and Pat Tate, he says to her, look, I can't speak at the moment, I'm with some people, I'll see you tomorrow, don't worry, everything's fine, um, I'll see you tomorrow. The phone call ends and then he is later killed. Now what Sarah Saunders found strange about that phone call is the fact that he mentioned he was with some people. She said if he was with Mick Steele or someone that she knew, he would have just said, I'm with Mick and the boys at the moment, I'll see you tomorrow, can't really speak at the moment. But that's not actually what he said. He said, I'm with some people, I'll see you tomorrow. Now, the fact that this phone call from Pat Tate to this unknown person lasts 17 seconds, could that indicate that that phone call was about Tate saying to this unknown individual, yep, I'm down the lane, I'm down Workhouse Lane, we're waiting for you, that sort of thing. 17 seconds is quite a short duration. Could it also lend a little bit more credibility to the fact that the Range Rover may have been waiting at the locked five bar gate for a period of time as put forward by the defence? We remember the soot deposits underneath the exhaust, which gave the indication, at least from the defence's point of view, that the Range Rover had been parked there for some length of time with the engine running. We know that when the Range Rover was discovered by the farmers, the ignition was switched to off. 
So you can only imagine this was done by the perpetrator or perpetrators of this crime. So could they have been waiting down the lane? Tate makes this 17 second phone call, says, we're down the lane, where are you? We're waiting for you. Um, how long are you gonna be? We're down Workhouse Lane, ends the call. Saunders then calls, this guy has actually arrived, potentially even in the back of the Range Rover at this point. And then Tate says to her, I can't talk now, I'm with some people. That would explain the Range Rover being there with the engine running for a period of time. Tate making this short phone call to see where this person is, how long he's going to be, giving him possibly directions to where they are. And then Saunders ringing up and this guy having arrived in the Range Rover. What is worthy of mention and something I must stress is that we don't actually know Pat Tate's position when he made this phone call. We don't have any cell data to show you know, rough proximity of where he was situated when this 17 second phone call took place. And interestingly, we don't actually have any mention of this phone call from Darren Nichols. If Steele was in the Range Rover with Tucker, Tate and Rolf and this 17 second phone call took place, then why did Steele not mention it to Nichols after the event? Considering he mentioned supposedly the phone call between Saunders and Tate, why did he not mention the phone call at 1826? He would have been in the Range Rover during this time period, yet this phone call is not mentioned. Interestingly, this phone call is actually omitted from the telephone bundle. I don't believe the defence even knew during the trial that this phone call even took place. Realistically, we can't even say with any great deal of certainty that the Range Rover was even down Workhouse Lane at 1826. As I say, because we don't have this cell site data for Tate's mobile to say, you know, a rough proximity of where he was during this time period, 1826, it's really hard to say where the Range Rover was located when Tate made this call. The following police statement is from Angus Jeffrey Fletcher, dated the 17th of the 4th, 1996. Around five years ago, I met a person called Sarah Saunders. I was introduced to her by a woman who I was living with at the time. This person was called Pauline Squires and lived at redacted Loughton, Essex. My understanding from Pauline was that she and Sarah had been next door neighbours some years earlier. At this time, I did not know where Sarah was living, but knew it was in the Basildon area. I understood that Sarah was having a relationship with a person called Patrick Tate, who at the time was serving a term of imprisonment for robbery. My relationship with Pauline lasted about a year, and during that time, Sarah was a frequent visitor to the house. When my relationship finished with Pauline, she went to live in America, and I remained in the house in Loughton. I continued to keep contact with Sarah, and this was mainly through telephone conversations where she would inquire if I had heard from Pauline or to tell me she was expecting a child by Patrick Tate. It was general social conversations, and the relationship remained platonic. Around January 1994, I had conversations with Sarah on the telephone and met with her on a couple of occasions at my workplace. At this time, I was working at the yellow advertiser, Acorn House, Great Oaks, Basildon. I recall that one of the topics mentioned was that Pat Tate was due for release in June 94 and he wanted to go straight. She told me that prior to going to prison, Pat had been involved in the car sales business and wanted to continue in that field. Sarah raised the point that in order to do this, he would need financial backing and asked if I'd be prepared to consider loaning some money. This stage of asking was not done in a single conversation, but was over the course of a number of conversations. I told Sarah that I would consider helping, but would need to meet Pat and consider my options. Some date in June, July 94, after his release from prison, I met Pat Tate for the first time at the Five Bells Public House Basildon to discuss the loan. Our meeting lasted around an hour and we were the only two persons present. During the meeting, Pat stated he wanted to borrow around £20,000 to purchase stock. I told him that I was prepared to loan £5,000 to start with and he could show me how he could handle that figure before considering a further loan. I only did this because Sarah had agreed to act as guarantor. This agreement was verbal. I gave a cheque made out to Sarah Saunders in the sum of £5,000 to her that same day at her parents' house in Basildon. Pat was also present when this was done. The agreement at this stage was that I would receive 25% of each car sold. 
Within two to three weeks, I had received around two to three hundred pounds from Pat Tate. I believe about this time, Sarah and Pat were moving into Gordon Road, Basildon. The arrangement looked stable and made me feel confident that my business dealings would be safe. At this time, Pat told me he had found a car site opposite Westcliff Police Station and wanted to develop it as a good place to sell cars from, but he would need more stock to operate it. Pat told me that his plan was to have a person on site whilst he travelled around purchasing stock. He mentioned that the person he had in mind was called Bill Baxter. Through Sarah Saunders, I injected a further £10,000 into the operation. I should mention that prior to the release of Pat Tate, I had conducted a lucrative business deal, which meant that I had a substantial amount of money in my bank account. This meant I was able to make these investments without too much concern. The arrangement for repayment changed, and I told Pat that I wanted a regular payment of £300 per month. He agreed to this arrangement. I received these repayments, and some weeks received more than the basic £300. I visited the site to see that it was going according to plan, and met Bill Baxter. I visited the site a total of six times. I had telephone conversations with Sarah which reinforced my confidence that my investment was safe. Within a further month, Pat suggested to me that as everything was going well, it would be better if the quality of the stock could be improved. To this end, we agreed that a further £10,000 should be invested by me into the business. I believe I gave £10,000 in cash to Pat Tate on this occasion. All repayments from Pat to me were in cash. After this further sum was invested, the repayments were increased to £500 per month. Towards the end of 1994, I started to notice a change in Pat Tate's personality. He became moody and temperamental. I raised my concerns with Sarah, who told me that her relationship with Pat was floundering and she believed he was taking drugs. I also believe Pat had moved out of Gordon Road, Basildon and had moved in with a friend called Nipper in South End. I do not know this person. I was still receiving my repayments, however, Pat was the victim of a shooting incident and this resulted in him being returned to prison. I continued to receive my repayments from Bill Baxter until April 1995 when they stopped. I spoke with Bill Baxter who told me that he was not selling the cars. I spoke with Sarah who reassured me that Pat would be released from prison in the near future and would sort out everything. She told me that her relationship with Pat was not good and she was saying that when he was released she would not be with him. She said that Pat had no interest in his son and generally their relationship was not as it had been. She also told me that Pat had taken to injecting himself with drugs. She did not specify the type of drug. As a result of this information and the lack of payments from Bill Baxter, I made a number of telephone calls to him to push for payments. Bill Baxter informed me that the cars were not selling and he was depressed. At this point, I realised there was nothing that I could do about the situation and had to rely on Sarah's reassurance that the situation would be sorted when Pat Tate was released from prison. During conversations with Sarah, the subject of leaving Tate was raised. She spoke of the problems it would involve and I believe she mentioned that she would have to move from the area or country if she left Pat Tate. From my conversations with her, I formed the impression that Sarah was trapped in a relationship from which it would be difficult to escape. It appeared to me that Pat Tate would not let her leave the relationship without causing difficulties. At no time did Sarah talk to me about Pat Tate in terms of wishing harm to befall him. I was aware from Sarah that Pat Tate had used physical violence against her in the past. I cannot give specific details about this aspect. After Tate was released from prison in 1995, I met him at Gordon Road, Basildon. I believe this meeting was towards the end of the 11th, 95, and was in response to him telephoning me. The meeting lasted about 10 minutes, during which time he assured me that he was going to sort the business out and get it back as a profitable concern. The car business at this time had moved from the site opposite Westcliff Police Station to one in London Road, Leon C. I never visited this location. Pat Tate promised to honour his debt to me and I had no option but to accept what he said concerning this matter. By this time I had a fuller picture of him and regretted my involvement with him. I just wanted to distance myself from him and the situation. That was the last time that I saw Tate before his death. I did not receive any further money from the date of the meeting with him. On the 16th of the 4th, 96, as a result of a telephone conversation, I had a meeting with Bill Baxter at the Halfway House Public House at Brentwood. 
There he gave me £2,000 in cash. This was the final money raised from the selling of the stock remaining at the car site. As a result of this payment, I am owed £15,000 without any interest on my loan. I would add that the car business operated as APB, which stood for Angus, Pat and Bill. These being the Christian names of myself, Tate and Baxter. I have stated the circumstances in which I met Pat for the last time, but I do recall that I spoke with him on his mobile telephone a day or two before his death. The purpose of this telephone call was to obtain a progress report on the repayment of my money. He stated that he was travelling to Southend and basically gave me promises of repayment in the near future. This was the last time I spoke with him. I did not know the persons called Craig Rolfe or Tony Tucker who were found dead with Pat Tate. One of the more common questions that I've been asked over the past couple of years surrounding the Essex Boys murders seems to focus on the drugs which were found in Pat Tate's bloodstream. Some people believe he was overdosed intentionally and others just believe that they were heavy drug users. In this video we're going to take a look at some of the evidence which could support either claim and first we're going to start with a newspaper article from The Guardian which was dated the 7th of the 3rd 96 with the title The Hit which describes what was found in Pat Tate's bloodstream. It's in this newspaper article that it states the following. They died in under two seconds, and only one, Tate, seemed to know anything about it. How much, as almost everything in this case, is conjecture. A post-mortem examination highlighted a combination in his bloodstream of heroin, cocaine, cannabis and steroids. Now when I first posed that question to myself, I guess I just thought it was a little bit outlandish you know these three guys were heavy drug users in any case taking pretty much whatever they could get their hands on so is it really that strange that Tate was found with that combination of drugs in his bloodstream but then when you tie it into certain other events such as the potential unrest between Tucker and Tate leading up to the murders and the fact that Tucker and Rolf had killed Kevin Whitaker just a year earlier via a similar method it did make me wonder if there was something more to this now many of you watching this video will have seen the films, the Rise of the Foot Soldier films, etc, etc, where Tucker and Tate are portrayed almost as brothers. But when we take a look at the official statements surrounding this case, it appears that shortly before the murders, there was a lot more going on than what is actually portrayed in these films. Just to give you a brief overview of some of the things that I've discussed in previous videos, we had the situation with Tate being recalled to prison after the shooting incident, we had Tucker going round to Tate's friend to try and collect the money on a car that Tate was selling whilst he was in prison. We had Tucker's purchasing of this brand new house, Tate being concerned where he got the money for this house from. We had, um, at one point in time, Tucker dealing with Tate's then long-term girlfriend, Sarah Saunders, and paying her a salary every month whilst Tate was in prison. And Tate seemingly had a change of heart whilst in prison and took that responsibility from Tony Tucker and gave it to Michael Steele. So there was certainly a level of distrust there between Tucker and Tate, particularly near the end. We also have the following statement, which is from Donna Garwood's brother. Now Donna Garwood was the then girlfriend of Tony Tucker and her brother mentions the following in his statement. I remember Donna told me once that Pat Tate had come out of prison. She said, he's only been out five weeks. She said that since Pat had come out, Tony had become worried about something. He had taken a bit of a low profile. He wasn't himself. Donna said he started staying in with her a lot and Tony was a bit jumpy. Donna said she thought Pat had done something which reflected on Tony, but she didn't say what. Now obviously that statement is quite vague in places and it does leave a lot to the imagination but one thing that is for sure is that when you combine that one with Barry Dorman's statements, the car dealer who was Pat Tate's friend, where he talks about Tucker turning up on the forecourt and demanding the money for the car which was sold on Tate's behalf and Tate calling Barry Dorman from prison and saying under no circumstances give the money to anybody else, make sure you keep it until I come out, don't give it to Tony, don't give it to anybody. And yet Tucker was turning up there to try and get hold of that money. There's something not quite right there between that relationship with Tucker and Tate leading up to their murders. 
Let's take a look back at Barry Dorman's statement from the 8th of December 1995, where it states the following. I did not go and see Pat in prison, but I was asked by Pat through Sarah Saunders to dispose of his current vehicle, which was a black 928 S2 Porsche. I took possession of the vehicle from Sarah, and after having some work done on it, I put it up for sale on my front for around £8,995. When I had the car, I received a phone call from Pat in prison telling me to keep the money if I sold the car and not to give it to Sarah or anyone else. I had the vehicle for a couple of months and during this time I took two deposits on the car, but the sales fell through. When I took the deposits, I used to put a sold sign on the vehicle and when I did this, I received a visit from the man called Tony Tucker. At this time, I think I'd met Tucker once or twice when he had attended the car front with Pat before he was returned to prison. When he came to my garage, Tucker told me to give him the money, whilst Pat was in prison. Although I had heard about Tony Tucker and I did not want to cross him, I was more concerned about crossing Pat, and therefore I told Tony I would not give him the money. When I stood my ground, I told him what Pat had said, Tony seemed to accept it and left my garage. I kept the car for a couple of months, but could not sell it. I therefore returned it to Sarah Saunders. In this time, I only saw Tony Tucker once more when he came up to my car front on a horse and asked me if I had any luck selling it. At this time, I had become aware of Tony moving into a house in Fobbing High Road with a large plot of land. I had a couple of phone calls from Pat whilst he was in prison, but they appeared to be merely for a chat rather than anything specific. The next time I saw Pat was when he came down to my car front after he had been released from prison. And then as I touched upon earlier, we had the situation with Sarah Saunders whilst Pat was in prison. Now, she was being paid X amount of money to keep her going whilst Pat was inside. Originally, that job was given to Tony Tucker. It was his responsibility. But somewhere down the line, Michael Steele, I believe, got called to the prison for a meeting with Pat or a conversation with Pat where he said that he no longer trusted Tony, didn't know what he was doing with the money. He wasn't quite sure where the money was going and whether Sarah was getting it or something along those lines. So he decided to give that responsibility to Michael Steele. So regardless, there was a level there of distrust between Tucker and Tate. And when we go back to that statement from Donna Garwood's brother, what exactly does he mean there? Or did she mean when she said that Tucker was concerned that Tate had done something which reflected on him? What exactly is being spoken about there? Now, throughout my time making videos on the Essex Boys case, I've heard a lot of rumours. I've had people coming forward saying they know things, etc, etc. And one of the ones that sticks in my mind is the fact that Tate was supposedly going to be drugged up and given over to someone else. Now, does that tie in with the sightings of the white vehicle that was seen following the Range Rover or the Range Rover following that white vehicle turning into White House Farm? just before they were supposedly killed. Does that tie in somewhere with that white vehicle that Tate was somehow rendered unconscious and he was going to be given over to someone else? Was that part of the plan? We know that Tucker and Rolf had done something similar before with Kevin Whitaker. But I guess the biggest sort of red flag for me personally that this could have some sort of, I don't know, credibility is the fact of these phone calls. And this is something I've touched upon in previous videos. I can't get my head around the fact that it's Tony Tucker who is speaking to this whoever it was at the Sorrel Horse Inn. Now we're always told that it was Tate that was you know the catalyst. Tate was the person who was the marked man in all of this. He was the catalyst for these murders. So why was it Tucker that was receiving the call to supposedly arrange the meet for that evening? Now some people will say that Tate was with Tucker on Timberlog Lane at that payphone when the meeting was arranged. But there's something that I'd missed, even after looking into this case for the last couple of years, something that I've overlooked, which was just staring me in the face the whole time, to be perfectly honest. When we take a look at the phone records, there is something which gives a great deal of credibility to the fact that Tucker and Tate were most definitely in two separate places when the meeting was arranged. If we take a look at the phone log here, 1423, Tate's landline, Tate's home address to Tucker's mobile. 1423. Then at 1429, the payphone at the Sorrel Horse Inn calls Tucker's mobile. Now this is the call which is supposedly to arrange the meet for later that evening, the one which they are later killed. Then we have 1432, again the payphone at the Sorrel Horse Inn, to the payphone on Timberlog Lane. 
So at 1423, Tate is most likely at his home address, phoning Tucker's mobile. Then that payphone at the Saw Horse Inn contacts Tucker's mobile, and then the telephone on Timberlog Lane. Now we know that Tucker was on Timberlog Lane because he was settling up a bill at a carpet shop on that very same road. So if Tate was the catalyst, then why is Tucker doing all of the arranging? Why is he the person that is arranging the meet for later that evening? Why are they trying to contact Tony Tucker? Is this because Tucker and Rolf were going to hand Tate over to somebody else? Was this a double cross which went horribly wrong? I think to summarise, without seeing a full toxicology report and looking at the levels of the drugs found in Tate's system, it's quite difficult to make any real sort of assumption as to whether that he was intentionally overdosed or whether this was simply three individuals who like to take every drug under the sun. Could this have been a double cross which went wrong, as I just said earlier? Was it Tucker's job to get Tate down the lane for someone else to be collected? Or was this simply just three people who like to dabble in whatever drug they could find? A Billericay man charged with robbery was remanded in custody by Billericay magistrates, but a woman facing the same charge was released on conditional bail. Patrick Tate, 30, and Sarah Saunders, 20, of Selworthy Close Billericay, are accused of robbery at the Happy Eater restaurant in Langdon on December the 18th. Saunders was released on the conditions that she lived with her parents. Reports to Basildon Police Station daily, does not interfere with any witnesses or visit the Happy Eater, and does not go within one mile of Billericay except to visit her solicitor and the court, and that her mother provide a surety of £10,000. Saunders will appear in court again on February the 2nd, and Tate is due to appear on December 29th. The following newspaper article is from the 30th of December 1988, with the headline, Dangerous Prisoner Escapes Courthouse. This man is on the loose and could be dangerous. If you see him, do not approach him, but report straight to your local police station. He is 30-year-old Patrick Tate, who yesterday made a dramatic escape from the dock of Billericay Court, where he was accused of robbery and possession of cocaine. Three police officers were injured as bodybuilder Tate of Selworthy Close Billericay powered his way out of the court to a waiting motorcycle. One WPC received a black eye and another officer was kicked in the face as police tried to block Tate's escape. But a Basildon police spokesman today said he believed witnesses inside the court tried to impede the police attempts to restrain Tate. Roadblocks, which were imminently set up, failed to trap Tate and police said they could not give a description of the motorcycle or say whether there was more than one person on the high-powered bike. Tate is 6 foot 2, broad build between 16 and 18 stone, and had various tattoos. He was wearing a fawn top, a green sweatshirt, and light blue jeans. The following police printout comes from the 8th of December 1995, where it states the following. Action number A305 from Registered Informant. The man who shot Tate is called Wiseman and is known to Potter's Bar. He was shot over a cocaine deal. Update to follow. Okay, now the first thing that I pick up on when reading this particular police printout, and I think it's important to remember before we go into this, that by the very nature of these documents, these particular documents, they are quite short, so they do lack a lot of detail and information in a lot of ways. But the first thing that I pick up on even reading such a short document like this one, is the talk of a deal and the potential of Tate being the target that evening. So at this point, where do we go from here with this information? Well, I've gone back and taken a look at some of the statements from people who saw Tate, who spoke to Tate on the very day that he was killed. What was his attitude like? What was he discussing? What was he talking about? And one of the ones that I remember quite vividly is the statement from Barry Dorman. It's in his statement that he talks about Pat Tate purchasing a vehicle from him. He was going to purchase a vehicle, then he decided he didn't need it anymore, but he would still purchase it because he was coming in to a large sum of money. This talk of imminent financial gain, if you will. So let's take a look 
at that statement, or at least a section of that statement, from Pat Tate's friend Barry Dorman. The following section of this police statement is given by Barry Dorman on the 8th of December 1995. During the morning of Wednesday the 6th of December 1995, I was at the car front when Pat, Tony, Craig and Mr P Cuthbert arrived in the Range Rover. I would describe Cuthbert as male, white, 5 foot 10 to 5 foot 11, late 30s, reasonably fit build. I've been told he is a ceiling fixer. The four of them came into the office and I was handed by one of them the paying in book relating to the Range Rover Finance and between them they produced £321.40 in cash. I was asked by one of them, I can't remember who, to keep the book and remind them when the payments were due. I agreed to do this as it was in my interest to make sure the finance was paid. I'd also been told by Pat and Tony at the time of purchasing the vehicle that they intended to pay it off in one lump fairly quickly. Right, so I'll just cut in here. Now this is the first sort of inkling, I guess, that there may be money coming in the pipeline. This talk that they could pay this vehicle off in one lump sum. We'll continue on as there is another part to this which does also back up this theory. I paid this sum into the Barclays Bank at Pitsy Broadway the following day. I can produce the paying in book as my exhibit BDT slash 4. Sometime during an earlier meet with Pat, he had asked me whether I had a suitable vehicle for him to give Sarah Saunders. He told me there had been a lot of problems between them and he wanted to give her a car to get her off his back. I told him I had a VW Passat on the forecourt, which I had taken in as part exchange on the 25th of the 11th, 95. I showed him the vehicle, which was metallic green in colour and had the registration number F120GGF. He agreed to take it for a test drive and we later agreed on a price of £1,800 for the vehicle. I can produce a purchase invoice for this VW Passat as my exhibit BDT slash 5. I left my garage forecourt around 5 to 5.30pm on Wednesday the 6th of December 95, intending to play my friend Keith Moore at Squash. At this time my daughter Susan and an employee Mickey Stenning were at the car front. En route to Squash, I received a phone call from Mickey Stenning stating that Herc, which is my pet name for Pat Tate, i.e. short for Hercules due to his size, had arrived at the car front to collect the VW Passat. Pat then came onto the phone and told me he would still take the vehicle even though he didn't need it, as he had had a bust up with Sarah Saunders. I told him that he didn't need to take it, but he insisted that he would. He told me that he would pay for the vehicle in the morning as he had a lump of money coming. As a result, I agreed to Pat taking the vehicle that night, which he did. So it's very clear to me, at least, when reading this statement, that Tate believed he was coming into some kind of money. And we're not talking about in the next week. We're not talking about in the next month. He's even willing to take a car, an £1,800 car, when he doesn't actually even need the vehicle. In his words, he is coming in to a large sum of money. He would pay for the vehicle the next morning, which would have been the 7th of December, the day that the bodies of Tucker, Tate and Rolf were actually discovered. He would pay for the vehicle in the morning as he had a lump of money coming. Was this because there was some sort of deal about to take place? Some kind of deal in the pipeline? Now, a lot of people actually don't subscribe to that belief that there was a deal because these individuals were most likely unarmed. Now, in Barry Dorman's statement, there is another piece of information which I find quite telling. It's where he states the following. The Range Rover was taken by Pat and Tony on the 14th of November 95. From that day, when Pat, Tony and Craig visited my car front, they would be using the Range Rover. Craig would normally be the driver, with Pat in the front passenger seat and Tony in the back. Now this goes against how these bodies were found, quite naturally, with Tate in the back seat, Tucker in the front seat. So the first thing that flashes through my mind when visualising what is being spoken about in this statement here, the fact that Tate would normally be in the front seat and Tucker in the back, this is telling me personally that the person in the back of the Range Rover was someone potentially known to Tate. And I guess really that goes alongside the official version of events in terms of 
Michael Steele being closest to Pat Tate. Does that mean necessarily that it was Michael Steele in the back of the Range Rover? No, of course not. But the fact that this seating arrangement has apparently changed from what is considered the norm, at least to Barry Dorman, tells me that that was someone who knew Pat Tate. It was at least someone who was potentially closer to Pat Tate than the other two individuals. It could also be explained simply by saying that Tate was the last one to be collected. So naturally the second person to be picked up would have been Tony Tucker. He would have quite naturally got into the front of that Range Rover. Tate being the last person to be picked up would have hopped in the back. I mean, it could be explained in those terms also. Now, when we take a look back at Donna Jagger's statement, uh, a paragraph of her statement, Donna Jagger's being the girlfriend of Craig Rolfe, the driver of the Range Rover, it's when she is discussing the events concerning December the 6th that she mentions the following. Craig wanted me to have something new to wear for the evening and took me to Lakeside Shopping Centre at 5.45pm. He was driving the Range Rover and left me to go and pick Tony Tucker up. Craig told me that he was going because he didn't want Tony to be in a position to say he hadn't had any part in the arranging. I also understood that Craig was going to collect Tony Tucker from his house and then they were going to meet Tate and Steele later. Now as a side note, this could go to explain what I've just spoken about there. The fact that Tate was in the back seat and not in the front as he was usually. So that could go to explain the seating arrangements for December the 6th in terms of the Range Rover. But what I find, I guess, most fascinating there about that statement or that section of the statement is the fact that there's talk here of there being a meeting later with Steele and Tate. And this is also kind of backed up in a way by the statement of Darren Nichols, where he talks about being with Steele, Steele telling him that he's going to meet Pat for a deal. This is almost reflected in the statement here by Donna Jaggers, that Rolf is going to pick up Tucker, and they're going to meet with Tate and Steele later. I mean, realistically, we don't even know if there ever was a fourth passenger in the Range Rover. I think oftentimes we get swayed and stuck on, maybe not intentionally, but we get stuck on the version put forward by Darren Nichols. And I think that's because that is the most commonly told version of events, the fact that Michael Steele was in the Range Rover. But you can choose to discredit all of Darren Nichols' evidence if you so desire, which really does open up a lot of different possibilities in terms of how Tucker, Tate and Rolf were killed. What I find particularly intriguing about this piece of information from this police informant is that this information came through just 24 hours after Tucker, Tate and Rolf were found dead. This information came through on the 8th of December 1995 from a registered police informant. Which ultimately leaves us with the question, was this some kind of deal? Did Tate expect to come into some kind of money? Maybe this wasn't even a robbery. Maybe it was a robbery. Maybe it was a double cross. The possibilities here are endless and I think that's what is quite as I say intriguing about this piece is that it allows for scope it allows for different possibilities different angles to be looked at in a more open way there is one thing however that I believe most of us can agree on and that is Tucker Tate and Rolf during this time period most certainly felt as if they were on the up that their luck had changed that there was a great deal of money coming in the pipeline but what exactly did that entail? Was it a straightforward deal? Was it a double cross? Was it a robbery that went tragically wrong for Tucker Tate and Rolf? And ultimately, did this end up costing them their lives? 